If I just talk, would you guys be able to hear me? Or should I use the microphone? In the back? Sweet, I'm going to do that then. So I can use my arms. She didn't say no. I'll tell you no. Does anybody have a step stool as well? <laughs> Hopefully I don't need um, So yes, I'm from Crofton. Thank you, Melissa. Uh, I'm from Crofton, but I was born in Osmond. Um, I didn't find that out until my senior year of college. Um, I had to get a passport, and you have to look at your birth certificate to get a passport. And I looked at it, I was like, wait, I was born in Osmond? I thought I was born in Yankton. <laughs> All of my siblings were born in Yankton. So it was a big surprise. I have a special place in my heart uh, for this place. And yeah, I'm just really grateful to be joining you guys this morning, this evening. I also have three kids. They stayed up really late last night. So I say things like this morning or this evening. It's chalk it up to that. <laughs> um, let's start a prayer. Father's uh, Holy Spirit, Amen. Hail Mary. Full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Amen. Amen. I seem to be losing my voice, so I should probably just use this. Um, so, how many of you guys have been on a roller coaster before? A lot of you, oh my gosh. Uh, so I am from Crofton, lived somewhat of a secluded life, and I uh, didn't really know what roller coasters were until I turned 10 years old. My cousin Blake um, invited me to go with my sibling to Worlds of Fun in Kansas City. Have anybody been there? Some of you. Is anybody scared of roller coasters? <laughs> yeah, so um, I didn't know if I was scared or not, uh, but I showed up to Worlds of Fun, and I get there, and you can just see this ginormous roller coaster off in the distance. And at first, like, I was excited. And then you get into the park, and you can just hear these roller coasters. Uh, you can't see them, you can just hear them. You can hear people screaming, laughing, um, all of this excitement. And so we go uh, around to these little rides, and it was just my cousin Blake. He's the same age as me, and so we were just going to do all this stuff together. And we get to the first roller coaster, and I look at it, I'm like, not a chance in heck. <laughs> so Blake gets on it, my siblings get on it, and I just wait. I'm like, nah, I'm not doing that. So I go to the next one, did the same thing. Next one, did the same thing. And uh, then we get to this other one. My older brother, uh, he played college football. He's a, he's a bigger guy, and he just looks at me and goes, Calvin, you were riding this roller coaster. And I said, no. And he grabs me. He grabs me, picks me up. I start kicking and screaming, and he sets me in the chair right next to him. And he holds me there. I have 10 years old, and he just hold me there. And I am yelling, I kid you not, I am just yelling. Ah, ah. And I can remember to this day, the, the guy running the ride just comes over and he's like, is everything all right? And my brother goes, he's fine. And the guy grabs the thing and just shuts it. And I'm just yelling at him because I'm like making contact. I'm kind of just yelling at this guy. So I go on the ride, I scream the whole time. I kept my eyes closed. My brother's like, put your arms in the air. I was like, no, you know, I'm just freaking out. And uh, I experience the ride and I get off. Yeah, the whole time, my brother's like, how awesome was that? And I remember telling him, that was awful. But I remember thinking on the inside, that wasn't so bad. And that was a lot of fun. And uh, I, I, I said, that was, that was incredible. And so I go, all right, we do one more. And then we went to another one, and then another one, another one. And uh, I ended up finding out roller coasters are a riot. Um, am I right? Who likes roller coasters? Okay. So yes, a handful of you. Roller coasters are riots. I love it. Um, and I share that with you because I think uh, that kind of summarizes, I guess, my experience in Catholic world, but with Holy Week specifically. Um, uh, at one point, just didn't even know that it was a thing to have Holy Week, to um, have this significant time of the year. Uh, found out about it, was relatively indifferent, just turned the other way. Um, was walked with somebody to experience it in a really powerful way. And then I found out that it is a riot. And it is an incredible gift uh, that we have as Christians, as Catholics, and as, um, as humans to be able to enter into this time of year. And now I find myself uh, like that of my older brother, just grabbing people, holding them down, <laughs> kicking and screaming, and just trying to explain uh, what a gift it is um, and what an experience it is to enter into this week uh, in just a really powerful way. So I'm really excited to talk to you guys about Holy Week. Um, 
With that being said, I'm not a biblical theologian. Uh, I don't have a master's in theology. Um, I've only been a practicing Catholic. Um, uh, practicing Catholic for about seven years now, uh, but the Lord transformed my life, He transformed my heart, um, and Holy Week, I, I guess for myself, has only been actively participated in for about uh, three, four years, I'll say three and a half years, um, and so I'm just excited to share with you guys some of my experiences with it and um, why I, I find it to be such a riot, as I said. Um, great, so this evening... What I'd like to talk about, can you guys see that back there? Lights are okay, great. So, uh, four things. So, uh, I want to just briefly talk about uh, the significant days of Holy Week. Um, so, the, what happened? You know, why is it that we're celebrating these? Um, and then I want to talk about what now? What is it that we experience while we're celebrating it here and now? I want to give three tips uh, for being able to enter into Holy Week. Um, I want to talk about what's at stake if we don't. And then I want to talk about celebrating. All right, so let's dive in. So first off, uh, what is Holy Week? Holy Week is just the week of all weeks. As, as Catholics, um, I didn't recognize this until, like I said, about three years ago, how significant um, this week is. Uh, we get to enter in to uh, a part of our liturgical calendar um, in an incredibly powerful way. And grace is present during that week um, uh, in ways that we can't imagine. So I uh, just had my brother's, older brother's bachelor party this last weekend. Um, so he's the last in my family. I have five brothers and sisters. Last in my family to get married. He was kind of one of those that went off the deep end. We're like, he's probably never getting married. It's like, wait, he's going to get married. This is kind of crazy. So we had his bachelor party this last weekend. Um, there was about six months of prep for that bachelor party. Okay, he read as a lot of obnoxious friends. And so there's 25 guys who are just excited about getting together to celebrate bread. You have months of preparation and planning. Guys took off Thursday and Friday and Saturday just to golf and hang out and celebrate my brother, um, soon to be married here in, uh, in, the next, uh, in the next month, the week after Easter. And it I just made me laugh, you know, like um, we as just individuals, we get excited about things, right? We, um, we pick highlights throughout the years, throughout our lives, and say, like, this is a significant time, and we dedicate time towards preparation for that. We as Catholics have the real gift of having a liturgical calendar, of having a time where we can just say, um, we're going to celebrate the most important things. And Holy Week is a time of preparation and excitement where we get to say, we get to celebrate the most important thing, that we have a God that loved us so much uh, that he came and died for me, for you specifically, um, so that we can live and have life in abundance. Right? And we get a whole week dedicated to entering into that time in preparation to, to celebrate it, uh, to celebrate that reality. So uh, uh, Holy Week starts with Palm Sunday, okay? so the Sunday before Easter. Um, uh, I'm going to talk about Palm Sunday, Holy Thursday, uh, Good Friday, Holy Saturday, and Easter Vigil, and then Easter. Um, but uh, in, in the church, in different traditions, you, you can celebrate things like Spy Wednesday, um, uh, and just have different celebrations for that on Monday and Tuesday. But we don't typically do that because Roman Catholics um, are, are in our traditions now. So that's what I'm talking about, Palm Sunday, and then I'm talking about Easter Tridium. Uh, so the Easter Tridium is those last three days. Uh, so like I said, Holy Thursday, Good Friday, uh, Holy Saturday. And what's crazy about that is actually we, we see those three days as, um, as an entire liturgy in and of themselves. Okay, so we would say we go to Mass on Sundays. And how long does Mass last here? Half hour. Half hour? An hour. An hour. An hour. An hour. An hour. Okay. Better not be over an hour. Okay. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Right, so it's an hour, right? So we would say, like, that liturgy, that service lasts an hour. Well, we would say, when Holy Thursday, when that service starts, um, it lasts, uh, that whole service, that time, that liturgy lasts until uh, Easter Sunday, evening prayer of Easter Sunday. Okay? So it's actually experienced as a whole um, service. We're actually entering into those days as if, they were, as if we were celebrating um, something like the Mass for uh, three days straight. It's pretty crazy. Great, so we'll start with Palm Sunday. What happened? Okay, uh, just, just a side note, I could talk about each one of these days and the readings that take place on those days for several hours each because they're so exciting and there's so much depth. I'm just going to take uh, maybe a couple of nuggets from each, uh, expand on them briefly, and 
and then move along. Um, and in hopes, uh, as we just uh, speak about these things briefly, when you get to Palm Sunday and Holy Thursday, Good Friday, Holy Saturday, um, some of these might, uh, you can remember these, uh, uh, but allow you to enter in deeper um, and hopefully experience it in a powerful way. So Palm Sunday, what happened? Um, before I talk about yeah, uh, Jesus asking for a donkey, um, uh, we read um, these readings during Mass, right, that explain um, what took place during this time. And prior to Christ coming into Jerusalem and asking for a donkey, so um, the time before that, he's with his apostles in a place called Caesar, um, Caesarea Philippi, okay? And he asks this question, he says, who do you say that I am? Okay, so he asks this question, who do you say this, that I am? It's a significant time in the Gospels because he asks these to, this to his apostles. Um, they give him an answer, he rebukes them, he corrects them, um, but they come to this conclusion, right, like that you are the Messiah, right, you are the King of Kings. And he tells them, shh, don't tell anyone, okay, like, it isn't time, right? We have to remember that Jesus, in his day and age, was living um, uh, in a place that uh, was under Roman rule, right, that was hostile to uh, anybody um, uh, threatening that of a king, so for that information to be out, to claim, make a claim such as that um, would mean that yeah, you would be persecuted and killed, right? So he has this discussion with his uh, apostles, uh, and they say, guess what? We're going to go back to Jerusalem. Um, they get to Jerusalem, and he tells his apostles, go and get me a donkey, right? Go and get me a donkey. And um, that's incredibly significant, okay? Um, it's significant um, because you can read throughout the Old Testament um, time and time again, that a king enters into a place um, on a donkey, right? And so you have a, a line um, in Mark's Gospel, I believe it's Mark's Gospel, where it says, uh, a donkey that's never been ridden before, right? And uh, that signifies that it was reserved for somebody of high stature. And so he requests for this donkey, donkey comes, um, and you have people um, freaking out, right? <laughs> People losing it. They start taking off their cloaks, laying them down. They have palms. They start laying them down. They're excited because um, this man has just identified himself as being the king of kings, right? As the Messiah, um, the person that's going to save the Jews, right? To be the savior for these people, right? He asked for a donkey. That's significant. Um, the people there um, uh, start chanting things. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. You guys have all heard that if you've attended Mass uh, any time in the, in the, in the uh, recent past, because we say it um, every week, right? We have this reminder, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And Christ, as he walks uh, silently into this, um, uh, into this town, into Jerusalem, he doesn't say anything, or at least Scripture doesn't tell us, but he's boldly shouting something, right? He's making a stand that I am the King, right? I am the Lord. I am the Messiah, I am your Savior, right? Uh, people don't exactly understand what that means, but he's making a very bold claim there. Blessed, he who is who he, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We say that every, every single Mass, and um, uh, so unfortunately, I, my grandma, she, she passed away a couple of months ago. Um, my grandma um, was an incredibly holy lady, an incredibly awesome woman, uh, and she had this thing, every time she would come into one of her uh, her kids' households or my house, she would do this. She would go do do do, and it was like just do do do, and you hear it, <clears throat> and it was like, oh, Grandma's here, right? And uh, since her passing, it's been kind of a, a cool thing. Me and my cousins, like whenever we see each other, somebody just says like do do do, and it's like Grandma. You just remember her, right? <laughs> and um, we say this at every single mass, right? Um, as this King of Kings enters into this city. This king of kings enters into this city, walls come down, and people remember that Jesus Christ is Lord, right? They recognize that Jesus Christ is Lord. As we repeat this, right, as we say do to do every single mass, we're reminded of, of, of Christ um, breaking down the walls of our hearts, entering into our soul, and being our um, king, right? So this day is significant, right? We're reminded um, um, that Christ is king and Lord of all. So what do we do now? What, what takes place? Well, uh, we read a really long gospel where that part is a part of it, um, but we get to read about his passion, his death, his resurrection. We get to read about the Paschal mystery. Um, we chant the mean parts, right? We get to participate in the gospel. We chant the mean parts, but we also get to say things like, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, 
right? It seems, I don't know, I just enter into the day, it's like, man, it just seems like we could be an active participant in this gospel, but we're just saying the meat parts, right? Like, crucify him the whole time. And then we get palmed, right? And um, we're reminded, uh, again, of our, our, of our Lord's kingship and our participation in welcoming him in um, to this week um, to start um, what is the most significant event that has taken place in all of history. So that's Palm Sunday. Um, <clears throat> for myself, uh, what changed three years ago and decided, hey, I'm going I'm to tap into the graces that are available this week, um, entering that this, that, recognizing that this is a significant week, not just attending Mass for, um, as, it, as, it, as it would be a typical Mass, but trying to elevate it and elevate this week into something significant. So I would just, uh, at the end of each of these days, I'm just going to give like a couple suggestions for things that I've tried in my life that have um, helped change my disposition towards experiencing Christ's grace and entering into that week. So <clears throat> one of those, um, uh, one of those would be, I would just encourage you to take on some sort of special fast that week, okay? To enter into that week by taking on some sort of special, for, um, special fast. So what I started doing with a group of guys was we committed to a bread and water fast for an entire week. So starting that Sunday after Mass until the next Sunday, we said, hey, we're just going to consume bread, hearty bread, and water. Um, I share that not to say, like, oh, good job, you know, but it, uh, it allowed us to enter in in a really powerful way to say, hey, we're not going to be... Um, we're not going to be just addicted and find ourselves just consumed with constantly worrying about food or sensual pleasures, but we're going to try to just um, remove that temptation and just commit to bread and water. That's been uh, a really, that was and continues to be just a really powerful way for, I mean, for myself to enter in. Um, it's something I plan to do um, until the Lord says otherwise. Um, I know my family, what we started doing was taking um, purple fabric, so um, the church throughout um, Holy Week, you'll see, um, will start covering um, its statues. Historically, they used to do this starting on Palm Sunday, but now it's usually reserved for Holy Friday. Um, but they'll go in, in their house, um, cover all of the statues, or the pictures, or the crucifixes, um, with some sort of purple cloth. Okay, So it's just a reminder that Christ entering into ci in the city, um, <clears throat> um, entering into Jerusalem, um, is going to be Put upon a cross, right? And we're just uh, uh, reminded daily as we go throughout our house, you know, that Christ um, um, is going to have to spend time suffering and dying for us specifically. So, um, uh, putting purple fabric on all of your imagery, um, doing some sort of fast uh, with food, media, um, um, something significant in that way. <coughs> I would also say something we started doing was just visiting other parishes, right? So entering into a, a, a greater time of prayer, um, as Christ had uh, traveled from Caesarea Philippi, uh, Philippi to Jerusalem, we had a real gift to be surrounded by so many beautiful parishes. Um, use this week to say, hey, I'm going to increase my prayer, and I'm going to begin to go travel to a different chapel and just pray there. Um, and enter into a time of prayer there. I know right now, just in this area, you know, with us as parishes having to um, cluster, to consolidate, start sharing priests, use this as a time potentially to say, hey, can I go to Pierce? Can I go to Randolph? Can I go to the surrounding parishes and spend some time in prayer? Can I bring my family? Can I bring my kids? Um, that's just a practice that I started a couple years ago as well. It's powerful. Great. So um, I'm going to skip over again. Yeah. Uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, uh, or Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, there we go. <clears throat> um, one thing my wife uh, started proactively doing, you know, Holy Week is not supposed to be experienced for yourself. I started participating in a bread and water fast, um, but my wife utilizes those three days um, to try to spend time with people that she normally wouldn't, right? Um, either inviting them over for coffee, inviting them over for a meal, um, doing something um, um, to invite people into how it is that she's experiencing Holy Week. Um, uh, myself, my job, just I was always with people, but using this time, especially I would say those three days, um, if you can, if you can invite somebody over for a meal, if you can invite somebody over to participate in this week with you, um, to have a conversation, I would take advantage of those three days to do so. So Holy Thursday, right? What happens? Jesus celebrates his last <coughs> supper. Jesus returns to Jesus. There's the agony in the garden. Um, uh, we, uh, we leave Mass that day in silence. Um, it's a significant day. So when I was 
little, uh, a highlight of my childhood is my family always had meals together. So we had five brothers, five brothers and sisters, but every evening we would have uh, meals together. At the end of every supper, um, we would say closing prayers, and then we would go around and just say petitions. So we would say something we were grateful for, and then something we wanted prayers for. I'm not sure when my parents decided to start that tradition, um, but it's special. So, uh, because there were six of us, ranging in ages, we had to set the rule that you could only share two things, right? Because uh, as a two-year-old that starts rambling things, or three-year-olds or four-year-olds, you know, uh, it could go on for a long while. So everybody could only share two things. But I kid you not, I can remember a lot of meals where we were sitting there, and I would just start praying, and I would go, um, Jesus, I help us to get a new dog, and please help the weather to be nice, and please, and as soon as I would start it on that third, right, um, my older brother would be like, two, just two. I'm like, okay, 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 back to prayer, back to prayer. But multiple times during that time of prayer, we were just being shouted at and reminded that it's just two. Um, and I share that because I just think of, of, of uh, Holy Thursday, right? Christ brings these guys together, right, these men that he's been walking with, and he's going to share a meal, but a significant meal. Right? He's going to, uh, one of the last things uh, that he does on this earth is he institutes the Eucharist. Right? Um, he celebrates Mass um, for these men. Um, and in that chaos, you know, we see um, Judas uh, betray him. Uh, and I just picture that as like, uh, it's in, in something so beautiful, right? Um, somebody having to be scolded. But um, Christ, he washes his apostles' feet, he spends his time with them, and he celebrates, he recreates the Passover. Um, I, I, I would love to expand on it more, uh, but uh, if you haven't listened to a talk called The Fourth Cup uh, by Scott Hahn, um, has anybody listened to it before? Oh my goodness. Um, I, I would just really encourage you um, to do so. It's called The Fourth Cup. Um, it, it would allow you to just uh, enter into that Holy Thursday and just... Uh, See how Christ has worked all throughout history to fulfill um, uh, his plan um, in instituting the Eucharist and being able to give us the Mass. Yeah, it's incredibly beautiful. So the fourth cup, I really encourage it. Um, but briefly, it just takes what we, uh, what the Jewish uh, tradition is always celebrated in the Passover, going back to the enslavement with the Egyptians. Um, you know, the eldest son needs to be uh, slaughtered. Um, the blood being put above the doorpost, Christ in that moment, right, um, takes that sacrifice that has been made for a long while and fulfills it, right, uh, in himself. The fourth cup, please go watch that. Listen to it. Right, it's also significant because we see that Judas betrays Jesus, um, uh, and Christ goes um, and starts to experience the egg in the garden. Right, so we leave that. We leave that Mass that day, and uh, it's the start of this three-day liturgy, like I mentioned earlier, a, a significant time for us to enter in in a powerful way and receive uh, these particular graces and particular gifts. Um, we see during Mass, as Joe mentioned earlier, you know, the washing of the feet, this beautiful symbolism of Christ um, uh, working directly with us uh, as his people, directly with his apostles and being of great service to them. Um, we also will see that the altar is stripped and um, the, 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 um, the sanctuary will be redecorated in order that we can just be practically reminded of Christ um, having to go and suffer and die on the cross. <clears throat> Ooh, before I get to this, um, I'll just say yeah, three ways that I think um, I've tried to utilize this day to enter into a deeper way. One is that of um, contacting all of the priests that I know. So either a phone call or a text, um, or somehow or seeing them in person. Uh, because this is a day that yeah, Jesus institutes the Eucharist, right? Thus instilling that of the priesthood. Um, and so it's an important day for just all of our priests, right? who get to bring the Eucharist to us in a practical way. So um, if you don't already do that, that's a day that um, I would really encourage you to thank your pastor uh, or any other pastors that you know um, in a really significant way. Um, doing something to just like uh, help you take on a different state of mind, right? So if you have it this far, I would say trying to cut out um, uh, the radio, right? Or other loud noises or entering into a time of silence. 
saying, okay, this is a significant time uh, where, where Christ is going to be scourged, uh, he's going to have to carry a cross, um, you know, he's going to be put to death, um, and myself, uh, not in a manipulative way, you know, like, hey, I'm just going to force myself to, uh, you know, really enter in, but in a, in a subtle way or in a simple way, try to say, okay, what's one step I can take um, to allow myself to enter into the magnitude of these next three days? So just briefly, uh, on Good Friday, we get to read uh, the account of the Passion for uh, the second time now. Uh, it's another really long reading, and we get to hear um, how Peter denies him three times. Um, you know, this man who's been, um, you know, his closest ally, his closest follower, um, it's crazy to enter into that, that word and, and actually just hear how um, yeah, someone so close to our Lord is still capable of denying him. And I know uh, for myself, just being able to enter into that time as just a sinful individual to just um, unite myself with Peter, at least that has been the person that I've united myself to in the last couple of years, um, yeah, it's just really powerful. Uh, Pontius Pilate questions Jesus. Um, uh, he talks about him being the unblemished lamb, which if you read the fourth cup, listen to the fourth cup, you'll understand the significance of that, right? In the Passover meal, uh, you had to take an unblemished lamb in order to put the blood above the doorpost, uh, the enslaved Egyptians. Now, right, uh, Pontius Pilate deems him an unblemished lamb who is uh, ready for sacrifice in the same way. Jesus scourged, um, and this wasn't just a typical scourging, right? So you guys maybe heard of 40 lashings. Have you heard of that before? Right? So that would have been a Jewish uh, tradition of being lashed 40 times, right? And 40 times is a significant time, it's a punishment, um, um, but this wasn't just a, a Jewish whipping, right? This was a Roman scourging, right? So um, if you've seen the movie The Passion, um, you know, one of the hardest parts to watch in that movie is when Christ is being scourged, right, in a powerful way. And um, that movie isn't too far off, or at least what I've been told or what I've read. You know, that movie isn't too far off from being able to pick you know, how gruesome and how brutal it would have been to have been scourged in that way, right? Um, to have had pieces of flesh being ripped off continually. You know, this was a Roman scourging. Um, usually the scourging would dictate how long you were going to live. So a typical crucifixion would take a couple of days of being on uh, a cross. He was beaten so severely that the scripture tells us it was about three hours, you know, that he was on the cross. Um, he has to carry his cross. We get to read about how um, Simon of Cyrene uh, picks up the cross and follows Christ. And we read how he is nailed to the cross, right? And he gets to share these words, it is finished. The cards come, pierce his side, take his body uh, to a tomb. What a powerful day, right? Um, and what a gift that we as Catholics actually recognize, right? That we take time out of our year, out of our crazy, busy schedule to actually allow uh, the church to remind us of um, the incredible sacrifice that was made for all of our salvation. So there's actually no mass that is said on that day. Um, there's a service, and the Eucharist is still distributed because the priest consecrates enough hosts. Um, but it's the only day out of the year that Mass is not said, right? So it's the only day throughout the entire world that Mass is not said. Pretty crazy. The tabernacle is empty, and then during the, um, uh, that service, um, you would do a uh, veneration of the cross. Typically, you would do a veneration of the cross in some capacity. So I know for myself, um, it's a day that I've started taking off of work, right, um, to actually enter in. My brother's friends were willing to take three days off of work, right, in order to go to a bachelor party. I know a lot of people, Husker games, of course I'll take Friday off, and probably Monday to recover, right? Um, but we as Catholics recognize that this is such a significant day that uh, I would encourage you, if you can, if you have kids in school, I think, I don't know, you who's in charge of the school, but I'd say take your kids out of school, have them enter into the day with you, yourself enter into that day. It's a significant day arguably the most important day outside of Easter, you know, for us to enter in as Catholics and say, Lord, I'm open to your graces, I'm open to entering into the suffering um, that you experienced, um, and in particular during this time, yeah. Uh, Northeast Nebraska has gone through some crazy stuff, right? 
Um, what's crazy is that we as Catholics get to understand suffering and unite it to him in a particular way. And so I would say taking advantage of this Holy Friday, this Good Friday, would be really important. Um, is that clock right? Oh, I've got plenty of time. Good, I'm rushing through this. Okay, so um, I do have time for a story. So my cousin Blake, I mentioned Blake earlier. He, uh, he was the one who I got to go on this roller coaster with and enjoy many roller coasters with um, him after that. We were really close going up. Played a lot of ninjas. We're always over at each other's houses. And... Um, before I moved back to Nebraska in June, started working for the diocese, I lived out in Colorado for five years, so I worked for an organization called FOCUS. Um, FOCUS, when I was with FOCUS, I got to serve in Boulder, Colorado, and Fort Collins. Didn't have any family out there. About three years ago, I get a call from my cousin Blake, and he goes, um, Calvin, you're not going to believe this, but he works with the military. He goes, I'm going to be stationed um, a half hour from you. I was like, this is incredible, you know? So my, my cousin, who I'm really close with, is going to be moving a half hour away. So he had just been married within the year. So him and his wife, me and my wife, got to spend a lot of time together. Um, they got to come over and watch our kids. Uh, we just got a lot of double dates. It was just awesome being able to reconnect after being apart for a lot of years. So um, not this last September, but this September before that, I get a call. And uh, it was from his mom. And he goes, Calvin, uh, she goes, Calvin, you need to get to the hospital. And she goes, um, your cousin Blake is not doing well. And so I just said, how bad is it? She goes, it's bad. So I get in my car and I drive 45 minutes to the hospital. I get there. And um, just a little backstory. Blake had been in the hospital for about three weeks. So he had been in the hospital. He had uh, uh, gotten a, a form of pneumonia uh, that they, they couldn't figure out. They couldn't just um, uh, seem to get a hold of. And so I said, you need to get to the hospital. And um, so I got there. And at that point, I walk in, and Blake was unconscious, right? Up to that point, he had been conscious, he had been able to function, um, but they had him hooked up into tubes, and uh, yeah, the doctor comes in, it was just him and his wife, um, and I got to just sit there, and um, uh, she just loses it, right? You know, her husband is in a lot of pain and a lot of hurt. And so she just goes, Calvin, what's going on, you know? And I don't know, I just get to start praying. We get to call a priest friend of mine, so he's gonna bring his last rites. And uh, the doctor comes in and they say, Calvin and Nikki, that's my cousin Blake's wife, they go, things have taken a turn for the worse, you guys need to leave the room. So we go to this separate room. And um, uh, a few minutes go by, it seems like several hours, and the doctor comes in and they're like, um, here's the thing, Blake um, is going to have to get on this machine. Um, uh, and if he doesn't get on this machine, he won't make it through the night. Um, the machine, it's going to take us four hours to get him um, hooked up to that machine, and we don't know if he's going to make it that long. And then they leave the room. Right? So I just have to look at this doctor and like, what? You know? Um, what? And it's like, okay, four hours. Like, let's go. Like, get going. What needs to happen so this gets a little quicker? <clears throat> doctor comes back at, at, after some amount of time, and he comes in, and he just goes, um, Nikki, here's the thing. Um, uh, the machine is coming. It's still going to be a couple hours. Again, we don't know if he's going to make it. Um, we need you to sign these papers that if, um, if he stops breathing, um, we're not going to resuscitate him. Um, because if we resuscitate him, he'll probably break ribs and it'll just be worse. Um, can you sign these papers? And she just looks at me and she goes, what? You know, like, no, like, what? Um, yeah, I didn't know what to say, right? I just had to uh, enter the situation, love her, um, and, uh, you know, just hug, right? Um, cry, weep. And um, uh, time goes by, a couple hours come in, or go by, and the doctor comes back in, and they're like, we got him on the machine. And I can remember jumping up, I slapped the back end of the doctor, and I said, good job, doctor. You know? <laughs> I was so excited, right? Um, but it was crazy, right, having to wait for those four hours, like the amount of pain that was felt there, um, sitting with his wife, just not knowing. And, and I just share that. <clears throat> I share that because the day before Blake went into that, right? The day before Blake went into that, um, into that coma, that sense of uh, rift being completely uh, turned off from everyone, he shot me a text. And he just goes, Calvin, um, uh, I know this suffering isn't for anything. Uh, what would you like me to offer it up for? And so I just shot back a text. I said, Blake, I would love if you would pray for my marriage and uh, for me and my wife that we can just be good to each other. I'd like you to pray for the mission that the Lord has me 
on whatever he wants for my life, that I would be open to it. And I want you to pray for just our families, you know, our parents, our siblings, that they would have a close relationship with the Lord. And, um, and then finally for my kids, right? And uh, he goes, absolutely, I would love to. So Blake survived that night. Um, uh, but then he went into a five-week uh, five medically induced coma. At the end of those five weeks, uh, he ended up passing away. And, um, and I can just remember, you know, just people coming to me and just saying, like, why? Why did this need to happen? You know, why did this need to happen? And uh, so much of the turmoil that we go in, right, that we get to experience, you know, the tremendous loss that has taken place just recently, right? It's like, why? What? You know, and uh, I just look, you know, and just look at the cross, right? And we as Catholics have a tremendous gift in being able to unite our suffering and remembering that this isn't for nothing, right? That God, you know, in a plan of sheer goodness, um, in choosing to create each one of us, um, we get to be united to him in his suffering and his cross, right? So I chop like that text, and um, the next day his dad flies into town, right? And he comes to me and goes, Calvin, uh, the, the next day after his coma, he just comes to me and he goes, Calvin, I need to, um, um, I need to get some things off my chest. Can we talk? I'm like, sure. Um, at the end of that conversation, I had called a priest. He went back to confession for the first time in 27 years, right? His father. Um, uh, it was a couple weeks after that that I had uh, a job offer from the Archdiocese of Omaha to consider moving back, right? It was not on my radar at all, um, but being open to whatever life changes the Lord wanted. Um, I joke, but my daughters are already signed up for a convent, so their location is figured out. <laughs> uh, me and my wife, uh, man, it's been a crazy year. We've been through some crazy changes, um, but I know my cousin's prayers have gotten us through um, some, some pretty rough times. Um, the Lord is at work. He does miraculous things. He does miraculous things when we can unite our suffering to His. Holy Week is a powerful time where grace is present in a powerful way, an incredibly powerful way, and we get to open ourselves and be tapped into it in a, in a really powerful way. We need to enter into the suffering in a way that we don't uh, uh, it, it, throughout the rest of the year. Um, and not because we can force it, but because the way our calendar is set up, right? Because we get to hear the word as a community of believers together. We get to enter into this time together, and uh, Christ just gets to make himself present. And what I experienced for the first you know, 25 years of my life was just a numbness. Okay, I'll, I'll go maybe because my parents tell me. When I had a choice not to, I'm just not going to go, right? But now that we get to make an active choice and say, Lord, I want to enter into this time of year in a powerful way, help transform my heart, help me be tapped into the suffering that you experienced, right? Um, in order that I could unite all of my suffering and everything else to you in a powerful way. Good Friday is a very powerful day. Um, so I, I said I, I take that day off of work now, and I would say I um, started a couple of years ago what I called a Good Friday hike. So I got a group of men together, and I said, "Hey, let's make some um, let's make some wooden crosses, and let's go on a hike." So uh, it started as just a handful of us. Um, we started doing this seven mile hike up to this mountain. We lived up in Colorado, so uh, up this mountain, and um, we would just do it in silence for the whole day. We just do it in silence. Um, last year, we ended up having 82 people come with us uh, on this hike up this mountain and did it all in silence. And it was just in an incredibly powerful way. And then we just prayed, prayed the Divine Mercy Chaplet on the way back, um, and especially at the 3 o'clock hour to start the Divine Mercy Chaplet. Um, that's historically the hour where Christ's passion has taken place. Um, so chalk that up and put a reminder in your phone at the 3 o'clock hour during Good Friday. Take some time to prayer and recite the um, Sark of Mystery of the Rosary. Enter into a significant time of prayer. But I would encourage you to take that whole day as a time of prayer to enter into Christ's suffering. The whole church body does across the world. And so yourself, giving yourself that gift would be important. <clears throat> Holy Saturday, Easter Vigil. So starting uh, with having received the Eucharist on that Friday, um, the church doesn't celebrate you know, a Mass or a whole 24 hour. So Holy Saturday, there is not a Mass celebrated during the day, but then we have the Easter vigil, right? So this time of Holy Saturday is a time of waiting, right? Um, you can enter in, and at least how I do is uniting myself to Peter, uniting myself to the apostles, saying, okay, what was that actually like to have to, holy cow, you know, the Lord of Lords, the God, uh, it's like the person that we had followed for the last two years is no longer with us. I just denied him three times, right? 
And so entering into that day, um, it, it almost gives you anxiety, right? Like it almost like, I just want this day to end, you know? Like I want it to be over. I don't want to um, have to, um, uh, yeah, enter into those thoughts. But what do we typically do? We numb ourselves with preparation for uh, Easter meals or uh, music or TV or Netflix or you name it, right? But I would just encourage you to experience that day what it's made for, right? To enter in this time of waiting, anticipation, um, somewhat excitement, but I would say um, sorrow, right? Again, not a manipulation like um, of our heart to say, okay, God, is, Christ has died, but uh, just a practical step to say, okay, um, Christ has died for my sins, and I can try to enter into that uh, uh, in a new way this year. So, uh, what do we get to experience in that Easter vigil? Uh, Jesus rises from the dead, so starting that evening, uh, Christ rises from the dead. Peter and John are told, you know, that this guy has, uh, has risen. They rush back, you know, and they find these burial cloths. Mary Magdalene encounters Jesus, and then Jesus starts appearing to just these uh, uh, different apostles, different disciples, right? The road to Emmaus. And we get to read about these things. During that... Um, Service. Okay, that's that's what took place then, right? How we celebrate that now. Um, the Paschal candle is carried into church, right? The Easter candle um, is carried into church. Um, it's usually I, I'm not sure how you guys do it here. It's usually experienced in the dark. You know, there's candles that are lit. Um, there's lots of extra readings. You know, we're reminded of all of salvation history. We read all of these readings to remind ourselves um, what is the history to get us to this point. Today to celebrate, right, the redemption of the world. Uh, we sing Alleluia for the first time in 40 days. We do a litany of, of the saints, imploring all the saints to guide us throughout the rest of the year. Um, and people are coming into the church, uh, <coughs> baptized and confirmed. Just for anybody who's interested, I know with Good Friday I mentioned just I, I took a I take a hike right take time off of work um, fast from food and to get away doing the bread and water fast. I would encourage you to try to stay silent that day as much as possible. I have three kids under the age of four; it's impossible, <laughs> but to the extent that you can, not be busying yourself. Um, saying the sorrowful mysteries of the Rosary, praying the Divine Person Chaplet, entering into that day in preparation for what is to come. say we've forgotten how to celebrate right because of the hecticness of our lives because of um, uh, just the busyness that we're in uh, we chalk it up as just another day right or um, I, I just feel so sorry for actually different denominations who don't get to experience that of Lent of actually entering in entering into the treaty of taking a significant time it's like being deprived of cake for an entire year and on the first of your birthday you know you get that piece of cake right it's significant but uh, in a culture where we just feed ourselves the cake all the time, you know, it's hard to actually enjoy it when it's actually worth it. And I would say Easter, for the most part in our culture, is experienced in that way. Um, so uh, why has Easter just been this incredible celebration? Um, because of the time that we get to spend in Holy Week preparing our hearts. So I would encourage you, if you haven't started planning your celebration for Easter, please do so now, you know. Uh, so Easter... Um, is an opportunity to live differently, to make a change, to say, I've tapped into particular graces and choose to live differently from this point on, to start rejoicing. People should see a noticeable difference in us. Um, the octave, so the Easter octave, lasts for eight days, okay? Um, so we celebrate uh, Lent for 40 days. The church and its genius gives us these Easter octave, right, which is supposed to be celebrated as eight Sundays in a row, okay? So eight significant days of celebration. <coughs> So traditions that me and my wife started, uh, you know, that Easter Sunday, when we lived out in Colorado, we would have a huge potluck, okay? We'd have a huge potluck um, where we'd have ribs and beer and food, and the only rule for people coming over was they had to bring something delicious or they couldn't come. And so it would just be this incredible celebration. We would usually hire a band. Uh, the last two years we've hired a band. And it was just an incredible um, time of actually sharing and celebration with the community. The next night, our neighbor, 
really close friend with who's also Catholic, we got him to start hosting a, a beer, bacon, and bright party, okay? So um, bright Monday has historically been the day after Easter, okay? It's this day of celebration. And uh, so the rule was, yeah, we were going to have delicious beer. We were going to have bacon, okay? So you had to bring a dish that had bacon on it. And we were going to celebrate, right? And then me and my wife would look at the rest of the week and say, how could we make these days significant and special? So one of the days we'd get our kids gifts, right? One of the evenings we'd make sure to go and do something in town or in our community. Um, last year, on that Friday, we went camping, right? So trying to actually celebrate those days and live differently, entering into the season is a tremendous gift. Um, and then Easter, the season, so we have the octave, which is celebrated. Easter, the season, lasts for 50 days, okay? So 40 days of Lent. Uh, Easter is actually supposed to be celebrated longer, right? We are the Easter people. Hallelujah is our song. So celebrating it as such, I would really encourage you to start planning that. Right, now that I've moved back to Nebraska, um, uh, I think I have, I think I've gotten my men's group, uh, uh, other guys in our community bought into, we're really going to celebrate Easter, and so we're hosting the Beer Bacon and Bright Party, uh, got a friend in Madison who's hosting the Tuesday night, got another guy hosting a Wednesday night, and actually celebrating it um, as a should. So three tips for entering in. Um, I would just say, number one, doing it with reverence and gratitude. So it's mysterious that we get to enter into this time, right, this week. Um, and to be able to enter in with a sense of reverence, that is a, it's a significant time. I have in a position, um, same way that my brother and all of his friends prepared for this uh, bachelor party, right? What are the ways that the Lord wants me to reverently prepare my heart to enter into this week? Yeah, and I, and I think so often as Catholics, we can um, get sucked into a routine of just experiencing um, uh, the Word of God. Uh, we can start analyzing it and just um, become maybe numb to it. Uh, but I would encourage you to actually, uh, with reverence and gratitude, to try to experience the Word of God. What does it actually say? And what is it that we're actually hearing? And what is it that um, um, the Lord is doing through this scripture, this living Word? Um, and how does it resonate with my life right now? And so actually experiencing it with a sense of reverence instead of just a numbness to it. So petition and intercession. Um, yeah, we're not going to just receive something ourselves, right? But we trust that God's graces um, can transcend time, can transcend people, and that we can be asking big things of our Lord, big graces. <coughs> We are not just experiencing this for ourselves, and we can bring people with us, okay? whether that's actually physically inviting them with us, um, or in our hearts, right? Actually bringing people to the Lord during this time. It should be an incredible time of just interceding and making lists of, Lord, who is it and how is it that you want to work in the lives of the people of this community, right? Um, for the people in Pierce, for the people in Randolph, for the people here, right? How can it be that you start interceding for those, those people and saying, Lord, during this time of suffering, in the same way that my cousin Blake reached out to me and said, this suffering isn't for anything. Um, I know that powerful things can happen during this suffering. We should all be saying, Lord, I know that powerful things can be happening because of your suffering, um, and I want to bring things to you like never before. Right? I want to start interceding for people in my life for particular things like never before. I want to ask a big thing of you. I would just say this, you know, John 15, 8. Everybody should write that down. John 15, 8. Uh, and I would just take that to, to prayer during Holy Week. Uh, Christ tells us, right? Um, he said, by this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. Right? How is the only time in Scripture that Christ says, prove to be my disciples, right? He gives challenges, but he says, prove to be my disciple. He says, by this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. Read right before that passage, John 15, 7, he says, uh, Ask whatever you want of me, and it shall be granted to you. Right? Imploring these men to, to ask big things, to actually petition him to do big and beautiful things. Um, so I would encourage you guys um, uh, to actually ask big things of our Lord, and then expect him to work miraculous things, um, to bear much fruit in your life, and utilize this time as such. Um, and then number three, um, just being an active participant. So 
So this doesn't mean you have to be an usher or sign up to do something, but being an active participant in the lead liturgy. You know, prepare for it, enter into it, um, and engage your heart. Um, it's a supreme event. It's not something um, I need to go, clock in, and clock out, you know. I checked it off my box. No, this is an exceptional time, you know, in our year to be able to enter in as Christians. Um, and I know I've already mentioned this, and it doesn't have to be a manipulation of the heart, right? It doesn't have to be a manipulation of, like, I'm having to enter into this, right? Or um, because Calvin says that we need to. No, but just freeing yourself up and saying, Lord, whatever you want to do, I'm just present to it, right? You know, let the liturgy do its thing. So what's at stake if we don't? Um, I would like to hand out this. Um, it's getting close to being a coffee event, so I probably actually won't have you read through that now. But I, I want to encourage you to do so. Does that sound good? So I want to encourage you to read it um, on your own. Um, and it's from Pope Francis's exhortation called The Joy of the Gospel. Um, which you haven't read, if you haven't read The Joy of the Gospel, um, I would encourage you to do so. Uh, but it's just two paragraphs reminding us of our baptismal call. Right? So our baptismal call. Let's say, so what's at stake with us not entering in?